So that was uh, just to contextualize uh, from where uh, this presentation comes, the, the main work. So 16th century European cartography, narrative descriptions of the islands and Spanish navigational manuals provide a framework for understanding the Caribbean region as a geopolitical stronghold of European rivalries and antagonistic propaganda for European imperial powers. This talk analyzes the articulation of European territorial claims in cartographical representations of the Caribbean archipelago in the 16th century geopolitical consequences of such assertions. Through the works of 16th century Flemish, Italian, and Spanish cartographers and sailors, such as Giovanni Battista Boasio, Gerardus Mercator, Juan Escalante de Mendoza, and Baltasar Bellerino de Villalobos, among others, I will reassess the role of piracy in the depictions of Caribbean islands and identify contra cartographies that dispute the Spanish, the Spanish crown territorial order. We will be addressing three main questions today. First, what were the geopolitical consequences of the European territorial claims made in cartographic representations of the Caribbean in the 16th century? Second, what role did piracy play in cartographic depictions of the Caribbean islands of this period? And lastly, how are claims of Spanish sovereignty over these territories and contra cartographies disputing those claims related to the representation of piracy by peninsular and non-peninsular cartographers. So let's start with the construction of piratical spaces, Caribbean cartographies. 16th century Spanish chroniclers of Indies elaborated a narrative of geographical homogenization of both lands and peoples to define the vice royalty of the Indies or the Caribbean archipelago. For instance, Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo y Valdez shows the island of Hispaniola as a frame of reference to describe the rest of the islands in the 16th book of his Historia General from 1535. Likewise, Bartolomé de las Casas cast the islands of Hispaniola Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica as sharing a common denominator. Indigenous peoples who, whether insular or continental, were universally humble and naturally kind. And I quote, because in this Indies, everything is the same, end of quote. While aware of distinct places and peoples encountered by other explorers during the first decades of the 16th century, Las Casas and Oviedo nevertheless attempted to articulate a geographical and anthropological continuity among the new territories of the Indies. Regarding an alleged continuity between the Mediterranean and the Caribbean archipelagos, Historian Ricardo Capadron argues that Oviedo's insistence that the Caribbean islands were Mediterranean was part of the project of creating a new Mediterranean, the Caribbean, for a new Rome, Spain in this case. The discursive homogenization of both the geography and the peoples of the Indies reflects the transitional process from a threefold continental system to a fourfold one. The task of crafting America as a separate portion of land equivalent to the other continents challenged the conventional cosmographic order based on the old, concept, old conception of the world island or Orbis Terrarum, consisting of Europe, Africa, and Asia. It is worth, no, it is worth noting that the Orbis Terrarum implied the existence of another island as the antipodes of the Southern Hemisphere, Orbis Alterius, inhabited by sapient organisms of an utterly different species. 
las casas and Oviedos, homogenization of the indigenous populations of the Indies eradicated the association of the Orbis Alterius with the New World. Several Spanish cartographers echoed this homogenization narrative of the islands in their depictions of the Caribbean archipelago. Spanish and Portuguese efforts to restrict navigational information during the 16th century focused less on concealing theoretical or cosmographic information than on controlling the circulation of knowledge acquired by sailors as they navigated uncharted waters. Key aspects of that experience were pirate, pirate attacks throughout the Caribbean as a result of the Spanish crown's neglect of the region after new continental territories had been discovered and new vice royalties were instituted. Historian Kenneth Andrews has argued that starting in the early 16th century, the Caribbean emerged as a fragmented region because of Spanish inefficiency manifest in the inability to incorporate and control the zone. Another factor that contributed to the economic decline of the islands was the scattering of Spanish settlers who left the islands of Hispaniola and San Juan for the continental zones or who went to try their luck in the newly founded, founded by royalties of New Spain and Peru. At this time, the phrase, Dios me lleve al Peru, may God take me to Peru, became a popular refrain among those who stayed in the islands. According to Andrews, by the end of the 16th century, Antillian ports became minor players because most of the ships were using the Cartagena and Veracruz trading routes to reach the Floridian Strait. As John Latimer has noted, the depopulation of the islands and their economic ruin allowed local commerce to be controlled by the English, Dutch, and French, in whose hands plunder and trade were never separate activities. Drawing on Martin Lewis' concept of metageographies, that is, geographic notions that rely more on cultural factors than on scientific data, the first section of this talk will parallel the lack of internal details displayed by the Spanish cartography of the archipelago region with the narrative of oblivion, or Spanish lack of interest in the islands, found in several maps. From the 1520s, the Audiencia of Santo Domingo attempted to gain the Spanish crown's attention by emphasizing their mines, sugar plantations, and other agricultural products such as bread and corn. In 1584, before Sir Francis Drake's attack on Hispaniola, the governor, Cristobal de Ovalle, wrote a letter to the Council of the Indies in which he stressed the need for military gunpowder and munitions, also asserting that he had previously written several letters without receiving any response. Later documents also show this neglect or this narrative of oblivion as the governor of Puerto Rico, Pedro Suarez, in 1595 wrote to the council, it seems that your majesty has forgotten me and this island. As we will see, Alonso de Santa Cruz, Juan de Escalante de Mendoza, and other Spanish sailors and cartographers contributed to the configuration of an ideological geography of the islands, marked by scarcity and vulnerability to maritime predation and illicit trade. Moving to the works of non-Spanish peninsular cartographic representations of the Caribbean zone, such as Giovanni Battista Boasio and Gerardus Mercator, in the second part of this talk, I will reassess the role of maritime predation in coetaneous depictions and identify contra cartographies that disputed the Spanish crown's territorial order. Besides displaying geographic data and emphasizing the economic potential of the islands, 
These maps depicted the threat to Spanish claims on these possessions posed by Francis Drake's assaults in 1585 and 1586. This raid by Drake stands out as the only one of its time to be depicted cartographically and have, and it has uh, all the maritime routes publicly divulged. While this representation did not end Spanish dominion over the region, it certainly projected King Philip II's lack of competence in protecting the cities of Santo Domingo and Cartagena at this time. The first part, mapping our islands. Spain's oversight of and communications with its transatlantic territories throughout the 16th century and beyond required a formal bureaucratic system. Functioning largely on an epistolary basis, the system involved several political organizations whose presence served to create the impression of a direct rapport between the Spanish crown and its subjects. In 1524, Charles I founded the Council of the Indies, an institution responsible for coordinating any administrative, juridical, and governmental affairs related to the recently conquered territories of the Americans and the Philippines. The audiencias, or high courts, for their part, dealt with the organization of the territorial jurisdictional entities, while the cap captaincies or governorships oversaw military affairs and the governors of the local and legal and civil administration. Through these institutional structures, Spain functioned as a modern transatlantic state that relied on vice royalties and audiencias to administer its territories overseas. For Charles' successor, Philip II, maps became, became an essential administrative instrument for overseeing his dominions without the need to travel. Borrowing on Emily Summertie's concept, maps became valuable tools for territorializing, that's her term, or possessing geographical space. Conquering newly discovered territories required the representation of physical territorialization through which the Spanish jurisdictional power and order were established. Maps played a role in placing territories within imperial concepts of domination, and these in turn materialized through visual representation. As Lauren Benton argues, maps were political instruments used in intra-imperial controversies over extra-European territorial claims. Encoding ideas of law and sovereignty, maps became both a technology in the service of empire and a metaphor for colonization, through which, through the process of accumulating and controlling knowledge. Mapping was incorporating into the repertoire of claims-taking practices, such as building forts or founding towns. It allowed imperial powers to construct extra-European sovereignty through symbolic assertions, linking legal and geographical imaginations. Considering these functions and usages of mapping practices, I will now focus on works of several Spanish cosmographers and sailors to examine how they contributed to the process of configuring an image of the Caribbean archipelago that emphasized the need of the Spanish crown's attention to the region while promoting Spanish dominion over the insular territory. The cosmographer Alonso de Santa Cruz opened his four volume geography, Islario General de Todas las Islas del Mundo from 1541 with a letter addressed to King Philip II. According to the letter, Philip II had commissioned Santa Cruz's works, and I quote, to have a clearer understanding of, of what his heart wished to place under crisis joke through the visual and narrative depictions of all the known and discovered islands, end of quote. Santa Cruz framed 
the depictions in his work as representations of spaces that were submitted to the authority of the Spanish crown and the Catholic faith, becoming manifestations of the crown's territorial claims. Beyond constructing a narrative of legitimacy, the letter to the king reveals an additional agenda with an emphasis on the island's agricultural and mining resources, it highlights the issue of depopulation that was negatively affecting, and I quote, the principal islands, end of quote, meaning Jamaica, Cuba, Hispaniola, and San Juan, or as they're known today, the Greater Antilles. Focusing on Cuba, Santa Cruz explained that many settlers had left because they were looking for new settlements on the continent, creating an exodus that took the form of four armadas that had departed from, the, from that island and discovered Yucatan, Cozumel, other parts of Florida, and New Spain. Considering the important function of seaports in supplying Spanish ships bound for Spain or Tierra Firme, Santa Cruz stressed their value as assets and urged Philip II to pay more attention to the islands as points of passage and for uh, as points of passage for great expeditions or puertos de escala y paso. The cosmographer even suggested that Spaniards, and I quote, who have been oppressed by misfortune, end of quote, and who, and I quote, are useless to themselves, to others, and to their king, end of quote, could be transferred to the islands. Underlining the archipelago's geopolitical importance, Santa Cruz contributed to the configuration of the narrative of oblivion by calling attention to the neglect of the islands under Spanish dominion. The name is Solario, uh, a book of islands is a term of, for a cartographic genre, as you may all know, that was prominent from 1528 to 1573, and that undermined cosmographic and univer universalist viewpoints of emph by emphasizing topographic perspectives. Lacking the rom lines um, of nautical charts, the Isolario was designed not to assist navigators but to show in a fragmentary, as we can see here, and this, continu this continuous form, the totality of the archipelagos represented. In this spirit, Santa Cruz maps of Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico uh, lack geographical and topographical details, focusing instead on signaling the main ports and in entries to the islands following the Porto and mother, uh, model and in some cases, representing Spanish settlements through symbols, as we can see here in red. Following this medieval Portland model, this also comes from Santa Cruz Isolario, his maps do not portray interior cities, villages, or topographic features. What we know today as the Virgin Islands, right here, I are identified as cannibal islands, and their depictions shows even fewer internal details than the principal islands. And those were the terms um, employed by Santa Cruz, principal and cannibal islands. The representation of the lesser Antilles, as they're known today, not the cannibal islands anymore, um, correlates with Santa Cruz's description of those territories as inhabited places with little value in Santa Cruz's words. And here you can see all the, the, the depiction of the bigger picture of the Caribbean islands and part of the, and, and Mexico. But we're gonna, we're gonna go to the representation of uh, Mexico and its relationship with the Caribbean archipelago by the end of the presentation. This is a closer look. I don't know if you can see here. Islas de las de los caníbales. Now maybe they use that term only for touristic uh, purposes, but that was the geographical uh, name back then. 
Juan López de Velasco, it's our next character, was the first principal cosmographer and chronicler appointed by Philip II, or the term in Spanish, cosmographo cronista mayor of the Indies in 1571. And he focuses uh, mainly on the outlines and the geographical locations of the islands, as illustrated in his Descripción de las Islas del Norte and later in his Descripción de la Audiencia de la Española or Española. He provides a larger representation of the Caribbean that encompasses the audiencias of Mexico, Lima, Guatemala, Nueva Galicia, and Santo Domingo. And he uses written words, mainly, to specialize this geographical information. He writes the name of the audiencia of Santo Domingo, or La Española, here in a, page, in a space occupied by the sea to indicate that the archipelagic political organization encompasses both land and sea. In his Descripción de la Audiencia de la Española from 1575 too, uh, that will be later copied by Antonio de Herrera y Tordesillas, López de Velasco underscores the transatlantic political apparatus of the Audiencias by listing several regions, ports, and cities of Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and San Juan as constituent parts of this Audiencia, la Audiencia de la Española, and we see again the Islas Caníbales, the Cannibal Islands. Influenced by 16th century Spanish efforts to institutionalize the science of cosmography as a political tool to legitimize the extent of the Spanish crown's jurisdiction, Lopez de Velasco's work exemplifies the quest to lay territorial claim through cartographic representation. The next senior chronicler, Antonio de Herrera y Tordesillas, appointed in, five, in 1596, revised and adapted Lopez de Velasco's maps of the Indies. These maps were published in his three volume of the Historia General de los Hechos de los Castellanos en las Islas y Tierra Firme del Mar Oceano, published in 1601, 1602, and 1612. Like his predecessor, uh, Herrera y Torresillas represents the archipelago following the Portunan model too, without emphasizing interior details of cities, villages, or topography. Again, he mainly prioritizes the island's general outlines and geographical positioning, contrasting the private interests of conquistadors and local officials against the public good ensured through royal laws and ordinances, Herrera's historia served to legitimize Spain's empire in the new world. Underscoring the role played by the Catholic monarchs in establishing both spiritual and temporal order while criticizing foreign incursions in the Indies, his work claims to document the deceit, and I quote, of foreign nations who have not done anything similar except to extract profits from the Indies, end of quote. During the 16th and early 17th century, debates about the Spanish crown's claims to property rights, dominion, dominion rerum, and sovereignty, dominion jurisdictionis, over its kingdoms, triggered a series of juridical discussions that challenged the relationship between discovery, territorial claims of possession, and sovereignty. There were three main processes whereby Europeans mastered America. The first one, symbolically taking possession of, this, of the lands, of the land. Second, physically occupying them. And third, peopling them. Possession was based on occupation and use, while sovereignty was conditioned on an official claim, although such a claim was only valid in the eyes of those who made it, for the most part. For both the Spanish and the English, symbolically taking possession entailed a ceremonial act that acknowledged the principle of res nullius in Roman law, whereby the first user became the owner. However, the Spanish showed less interest in this doctrine because their title in colonial America was primarily based on papal concessions granted to the Spanish crown. Therefore, their principal concern was to rationalize their lordship over the people who inhabited the islands they wished to settle. In this process, 
Spanish efforts to systematize the extent of their dominion over the Caribbean archipelago hinged on cartographic representations. Benton argues that done the, during the early modern period, the seas were perceived as space constituted by maritime passages or jurisdictional corridors. As a result of the increasing militarization of these corridors, the Spaniards conceived their maritime voyage as marking the rotas or caminos within the sea and understood the value of keeping secret any precise knowledge about such tracts. With the increasing Spanish need to make public territorial claims for diplomatic purposes, the tendency grew for published maps to emphasize this aspect while suppressing new practical and navigational knowledge. And here we have two unpublished manuals, unpublished manuals of the time. One by Juan Escalante de Mendoza, Itinerario, it's a longer title, but in short, Itinerario from 1575. And then Baltasar Bellerino de Villalobos, Luz de Navegante from 1592. They both illustrate the tension between secrecy and public claims that lies at the heart of cartographic production at the end of the 16th century. In Bellerino's case, his manual expresses explicit awareness of its publication by including the word light, loose, in the title. Loose may stand for light from a lamp or a lighthouse that guides sailors a sailor's way as they navigate the seas today, right? But it also, and at that time, what it's alluding to is to the need to bring the material to light by publishing it and making it accessible to experienced and inexperienced navigators alike. The clash between theory and practice or between cosmographers and pilots resulted in the articulation of two types of knowledge about the Atlantic with different aims. On the one hand, we have cosmographic public knowledge primarily expressed in latitudes and longitudes was relevant to diplomatic discussions because both were tools for legitimizing territorial claims. On the other hand, practical and local knowledge was excluded from charts and maps because its dissemination did not confer any diplomatic advantage. Both Escalante and Bellerino convey practical and navigational knowledge in their works. In the case of Bellerino, this takes the form of handmade sketches, as you can see here, showing the main coastal landscapes of the islands and other continental Spanish territories to orient sailors in their navigation. In the case of Escalante, practical advice appears on matters of as such as how to deal with piracy and what to expect when landing on Caribbean islands. Cons cons uh, consequently, none of these navigational manuals were published because neither did much to promote the expansion of the Spanish crown's territorial possessions overseas. In Escalante's case, for instance, King Philip only authorized the publication of the part dedicated to the study of celestial bodies. And the manuscript uh, currently at the Biblioteca Nacional de España, uh, the copy conserved from the seven from the 1700s, 1754 to be exact, doesn't have any images. Both authors address the phenomenon of piracy, showcasing the relationship between maritime predation and their divulgence of practical, practical and navigational knowledge. While Bellerino alludes to English maritime predation and foreign incursions to legitimize the creation of his manual and reaffirm his authoritative voice, Escalante incorporates the topic of piracy in his description of the Caribbean in its current state. Bellerino stresses that after being a priest in the Colegio de San Gregorio, he began a career as a sailor when the city of Mexico decided to send 300 men to fight against Captain Drake. Because of his experience of sailing and following Drake's raid, Bellerino claims to have gained practical knowledge that previously he could only expect speculate about. Touching on piracy enabled Bellerino to increase the relevance of his manual. Bellerino roundly criticizes the state of navigational manuals at the time, arguing that foreign nations know, know more about the roots of the, to the Indies than the Spanish, 
who are entitled to that knowledge as masters of those territories. He discredits the content of Escalantes Itinerario, alleging that the documents written by him were full of inappropriate things that were too long and from which very little could be learned. However, what probably influenced the council's decision against publishing the text was the fact that Bellerino included about 115 images, uh, just similar to these example sketches, representing the coastal views of the Caribbean islands and other adjacent continental territories from the viewpoint of a sailor on board. On the, on, the, on the one hand, this manuscript renders Spanish territorial possessions visible before the rest of the nation, while on the other, it also provides pirates and unentitled foreign sailors, as he says, with local practical navigational knowledge that can only be acquired through experience. Echoing Santa Cruz's narrative of oblivion in the Caribbean island, Escalante, now we go to Escalante de Mendoza, links the narrative of negligence on the part of the Spanish crown with piracy and contraband, while explaining the presence of foreign sailors in the region and specifically on the island of San Juan, Puerto Rico. And he says, and I quote, the seaports of this island are less frequented by Castilian Spanish ships than by the French and other foreign nations who navigate to these places without permission. Unlike Santa Cruz, who had previously recommended the transfer of new settles to the islands, as I discussed earlier, Escalante advises Spanish sailors to avoid visiting the island of San Juan if they were attempting to become wealthy. He even says, and I quote, even though the name of its main seaport, Puerto Rico, or wealthy port, the inhabitants of the island and not that wealthy, end of quote. Stressing the dangers posed by these islands, such as foreign sailors and indigenous rebellious populations, as well as the lack of economic profit, Escalante gives this general advice on navigation to the Caribbean. And I quote, one should stay only briefly in any part of these islands. By underscoring the absence of Spanish ships and warning Spanish sailors about the lack of wealth in the region, Escalante's description of the island serves as an ideological representation of the Caribbean as a space marked by the inefficiency of peninsular and colonial authorities who fail to enhance economic development and address the issue of foreign interlopers likely to engage in illicit trade or pirates attacks. And he gives advice about how to approach of a ship that looks like a pirate, and he says that you should hoist the the the, the sails and wait for any response. And so he provides advice on how to deal with piracy as a sailor. But who were those foreign sailors to which uh, Bellerino and Escalante refer to? who were the pirates or the entitled European citizens who navigated transatlantic waters. Let's take a look. Mapping their islands. I will now turn to the analysis of the visual representations that account for the presence in the Caribbean of those considered foreigners in the eyes of the Spanish crown. These maps of the places called principal islands were primarily developed by non-Spanish cartographers. They use the visual and narrative representations of the Caribbean geography as a tool for projecting economic interests and challenging the Spanish crown's hegemony through the depiction of Drake's attacks. And here we have the image of the Caribbean that emerges out of these ideological and geographical representations is a diverse space under constant intervention by European agents foreign to the Spanish crown or by citizens of its non-peninsular contested realms. One such citizen was the Flemish geographer Gerardus Mercator, who engraved maps of the islands of Cuba, Hispaniola, San Juan, Jamaica, and Margarita that were published in 1578, 1590, and 1607 and 1630 with minor alterations. And I want you to see this and try to remember how Santa Cruz 
Lopez de Velasco, and even Herrera y Tordesillas depicted the Caribbean islands. And this is coetaneous. This is contemporary, the, the engraving of the uh, Caribbean islands. So one of these maps duplicates the port of Havana in a close-up next to a depiction of the island of Cuba, as if to emphasize the island's economic activity. Two other, and here it is what I'm referring to the close-up of the port of the city of Havana. Two other versions of this map, as you can see, include Latin inscriptions that underscore the economic value of the Caribbean region. Both versions read, and I quote, Portus celeberimus totius India occidentalis, the, the most famous port in all the West Indies, and include the close-up of the Havana seaport. They also display an inscription at the northern part of Venezuela that reads, Portus regius salinus catens spontaneis in vale solo laboris pretio petitur. Royal port with plentiful salt located in a valley and available for the price of labor. Mercatus, Mercator's maps mark the political territorialization of the maritime space through their Latin inscriptions, highlighting potential sources of monetary profit and through their depictions of ships. By the same token, we can see a contra-cartographic effort or the questioning of the Spanish order in the representation of a ship located in, at the western part, as, at, on the western uh, end of Hispaniola, imprinted, we see it right here, and right here, with uh, changing flags design, illustrating different political potentialities. Two of these maps show the Burgundy Cross flag of Spain introduced in naval fortresses by Charles I, while another map depicts a flag with a design that resembles the Dutch tricolor, first used by the Dutch in revolt against Spain, led by Prince William of Orange. This is, it's, it's, uh, this is the, the close-up of one of these maps. A closer look at the map reveals that the same ship has a second flag with a design resembling the Dutch triple prince flag, which had different versions featuring up to 11 stripes by the end of the 16th century. If the engraver had intended to depict the Dutch rebel tricolor hoisted during the 80 years war against Spain, then this second flag heralds the later independence of the Dutch and symbolizes their eagerness to introduce themselves into Spain's commercial monopoly, projecting their capacity to navigate Caribbean waters. Further, Mercatos engravings feature detailed topographic representations of, of, the, of the island's interiors. And here you can see. For instance, they find names of the cities and regions in Spanish and Latin, uh, and names such as Haiti, Quisqueya, Albayamo, um, Samana, among others. And maps of Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, and Margarita show more mountainous regions, towns and cities, Spanish settlements, and forest areas. Overall, these maps offer more information in both symbols and words about towns, rivers, and ports than the Spanish cartographers discussed earlier. Now, moving to the relationship between cartography and piracy, let us examine the representations of Giovanni Battista Boasio an Italian artist residing in London who depicted Drake's Caribbean raid of 1585 and 1586, an account of which is given in Walter Big's text entitled A Summary and True Discourse of Sir Francis Drake West Indian Voyage. And it also appears in the Ries Grand Voyage Latin edition of 1599. So, and here we have his, uh, his uh, Boasio's world map. Boasio's world map, which uses a line lines, and you can see them here, to trace Drake's Caribbean raid, represents a geopolitical representation of the Caribbean in relation to the old world. The two lines representing the movement of 23 ships uh, are labeled the way outward and the way homeward. South America is identified with Spanish flags, and the Caribbean locus, as you can see here, it lacks of any imperial power flag. This provides a cartographic image that undermines Spanish claims of jurisdictional power over the region. 
Beyond contesting official perspectives, Boasio's depiction of Drake's attack on Santo Domingo also strategically destabilizes the Spanish conception of its territorial order overseas and in turn projects a rising spirit of English military supremacy over the Spanish, the ones entitled to rule the islands. And here we have that depiction of Drake's Caribbean raid in Santo Domingo. Boasio's representation of Drake's Caribbean raid emphasizes the economic potential of the region and depicts the cities under attack in some detail. For instance, unlike Spanish cartographers, his engraving of Santo Domingo displays a detail, detailed city map from a bird's eye, bird's eye view bordered, a uh, bird's eye perspective bordered by a sea filled with ships carrying the English 16th century royal banner and their naval flag depicting St. George's cross. In the Roman tradition, which influenced Hispanic notions of geographical order, cities were associated with the imperium understood as command or order. Boasio's depiction of Santo Domingo's urban grid allows the viewer to identify the locations of Rhodes and the cathedral in the central plaza, as well as the outline of the defensive wall, the military fortress, and the positions of several Spanish cannons. The map includes Latin and French inscriptions underscoring Hispaniola's resemblance in grandeur, magnitude, and geographic extension to English cities. It also emphasizes the city's proximity to the roads of the rest of the neighborhoods on the island. On the other hand, Boas's representation of Drake's attack on Cartagena, which appears in the Brice collection from 1599 under the title Franciscus Draco Cartagena Civitatem Spugnat, also shows a detailed port city, city's urban grid, along with a depiction of an assault by English troops by land and sea. The short description that you see uh, at the bottom part that accompanies the image underscores its special and political importance by stating that Cartagena is the door to all the commerce between Spain and Peru. Ships labeled with English flags occupy the maritime space surrounding the territorial space, as you can see again. This edition, in, in this, uh, in, in this edition, uh, the Brice edition, which is a later edition of the attack, we also see the narration right here um, that recounts the events of the, of the attack. Uh, these descriptions evoke what, what Ricardo Padron calls prose cartography, employed by explorers, chroniclers, and conquerors through which the reader could, could create an image of the Americas from a bird's eye perspective. In Boasio's map, we see the same narrative strategy combined with the visual depiction of the event. Certainly, the combination of cartography and written annotations resembles the military cartography of the time, but the map also projects a single contra-cartographic spatial narrative in which Spanish jurisdiction in the New World is under threat of attack by the English. Rather than depicting a war whose outcome results in the imposition of a different regime or political order, or political order, we see no um, the projection of a contra cartographic. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we see that in both maps uh, they portray a city under siege. Like rather than presenting the the outcome of this attack. But we see it's a city under siege. It's a Kivitatem Expugna by Drake. That's the 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 um, the urgency to uh, the purpose, the urgent purpose of the map. Boasio's contra cartographies support the notion of Caribbean space as part of a fractured Spanish territorial order subject to unofficial, unofficial, unofficial invasion. In this respect. His maps serve as a visual representation of Big's account of the Caribbean raid, which was critical of Philip II's territorial ambitions. Big underlines the relation between geographical space and political interest by emphasizing Philip, Coates, Philip II's coats of arms, the world is not enough, found in the governor's lodge in Santo Domingo. And here is a quote uh, from uh, Walter Biggs, who describes the uh, Francis Drake's uh, attack to uh, Cartagena and Santo Domingo, and also St. Augustine, and also um, uh, some of the Canary Islands. And this uh, Boasio created, created these maps originally to accompany this text. 
And here uh, we, we see what he describes a, a, a fresco or a painting in the wall that he saw at the governor's lodge in Santo Domingo. Uh, in other words, the wall displayed a very large Spanish shield that included in the lower part a visual representation of the globe with a horse on top of it with a scroll containing the Spanish king coat of arms. Beek's ekphrastic maneuver of vividly describing the escutcheon amplifies the meaning of the act of mapping as a means of owning and possessing the space represented. In this case, the English sailor's ekphrasis served as a rhetorical device with a twofold function. First, it became a metaphorical representation of the 15th, 17th world's geopolitical stage where Spain claimed control over the whole circuit of the sea and earth, as he mentions. And second, the act of finding such a visual representation provides bits with a justification for maritime predation and for the dissemination of propaganda against the Spanish king and his inability to preserve what he claims to dominate. And here is the, the el llamado, no? the call for taking the arms against uh, Philip II. In this way, through the representation of geographical space, along with its geopolitical implications, the visual and narrative description of power poses the question of who is entitled to own maritime and territorial space, and thus, who is entitled to classify acts of hegemony hegemony, sorry, on the part of others as piracy. There is no surviving evidence of the existence of this uh, painting on the wall that Biggs claimed he saw uh, today, unfortunately. The way Boasia's map originally, maps actually, both of them, originally intended to accompany Biggs' account, appropriates Drake's attacks against Santo Domingo, informs two later maps attributed to Mateos Median and Alain Mejeson Malé. Based on Boasio's city plan of Santo Domingo, Marian's map identifies five places, a cathedral, a plaza, a castle, and a city garden, and St. Barbara's Abbey. Unlike Boasio's engraving, Marian's illustration excludes the Anglo-Spanish conflict. He neither depicts the English and Spanish troops fighting in the western part of the city, nor does he include the three ships burning in the Osama River. Using stylized lines to depict the outlines of the houses, buildings, and other structures, Marianne's urban design enables the viewer to discern more details than those found in Boasio's depiction, but they're very similar. On the other hand, in his, in, in his description of the city, uh, Male, here's the other uh, um, engraver, does not refer to Drake's attack, but uh, he does mention the French pillaging in um, 1536 and 1638 when describing the city of Havana, Cuba. It is worth noting that while Escalante underscored before, as we discussed before, that Puerto Rico is anything but wealthy, Maye explains its that its name comes from the goodness of its port, where the largest galleons are completely safe. Even though neither engraver shows to depict the English attack, arguably, they both base their city plans of Santo Domingo on Boasio's maps, which was a common practice around the time, uh, uh, sharing those uh, engravings and repeating them in print. To conclude, this presentation has focused on the visual and narrative descriptions of the Caribbean islands and adjacent port cities like Cartagena and Santo Domingo that create a geography of danger marked by maritime predation, predation and imperial aspirations. The later adoption of Boasio's maps in these works uh, from the second half of the 17th century illustrates a historical context in which inter-imperial disputes over the possession of the Caribbean islands no longer concerned the legitimation of the European right to rule those territories. By the end of the 16th century, part of the jurisdiction of the Caribbean was transferred to the Audiencia of Mexico, removing power from the Audiencia of Santo Domingo, capital of Hispaniola. Later maps, such as one by Vicenzo Coronelli from 1688, place the Caribbean region as part of the Mexican archipelago and no longer as an independent region. The transfer not only gave more jurisdictional power to New Spain, 
but also as these map events gave more presence to Mexico within the scope of the Caribbean region. The Caribbean archipelago changed from an independent network of islands, as depicted in the cartographic works discussed, to a component of the Mexican archipelago. Unlike the 16th century maps, this map registers a fragmented Caribbean that is subject to English, French, and Dutch hegemony. In sum, then, through the analysis of the instrumentalization of 16th century maps, we have examined the narrative of Spain's legitimation of its power over the Caribbean islands and the contestation of this narrative through the articulation of contra cartographies, cartographies primarily executed by rivals of the Spanish crown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. That was wonderful and very, very clearly presented, uh, which is always great. Uh, we have time for questions. So please uh, feel free to uh, just go, go ahead and ask questions. Junia. Yes, I would like you to, uh, what do you think? Is that the pirates arrived first and then they appeared in the cartography or the cartography puts the place as a, a, a dangerous place, and then the pirates went. What do you think, Carl? That's a great question. That's a that's a super interesting question. So just to um, just because I think it's very important, and this is not part of the uh, of the presentation here. I think it's, and that was a discovery that actually Chet was part of it. Uh, one of the 16th century representations of Ptolemeo's work is where we can see actually a region called Piratae. Uh, and, and, and that's, uh, it, it's very interesting. Uh, you, uh, the use of the term pirate you know, as a geographical uh, term, like, like denominating a space, an area, right? And then from that on, we have the whole development of the figure of the pirate for um, centuries, right? Um, so I just wanted to use that as a as a reference, as a um, as a context for for my for my the answer to your question, which is super interesting, and I have to think that that will be a book in itself. Um, so we have that we have in the 16th century uh, people depicting the region of Pirata uh, on the one hand, and also. What I think is that the by in the 16th century, these things changed as piracy changed as a phenomenon during the 17th century, because in the 16th century, we have pirates and corsairs. And then we have in the 17th century, buccaneers and freebooters and or filibusters and, and, and so on. Like we have other categories associated with piracy. But I think that in this period, in the 16th century, um, the pi what, what we see here is the represent the they know that there is there are maps about these places they just want to imprint their presence in those maps they know spain has all this information secluded hidden in a drawer in the council of indies the real the padron real Re yeah the padron real uh, or the major map, the master maps, they know all of that. And they just want to imprint their presence in the map. They're not, they know they're not creating new knowledge. The new knowledge they're creating is the interruption or the disruption of Spanish jurisdiction or claim to order or rule the islands. I don't know if I answer your question. Your, your question. Thank you. It's a wonderful question. Mariana, I was, oh, Lourdes. Thank you. I have no, I, I don't know if you are listening to me uh, well, because I'm, I have been fighting a bit with the sign now. Um, thank you for your chat, uh, Mariana. And I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I, well, uh, something about uh, the, 
the maps made by God. Well, when, first, um, when you talked about uh, the Caribbean islands um, as a cannibal islands, I think it is interesting. And uh, I don't know if you have been uh, think well, if you thought about this map of Sebastian Munster, which is from, it's about 1544 or something like that. But it, it was sold and uh, printed until uh, the half of the 17th century, uh, which is the first map of America as a continent. He has mm -hmm. this, um, this representation, graphical representation on Caribbeans, actually in Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the place actually where Waltz uh, uh, and Mueller, some uh, years before, 40 years, well, 30 something, uh, uh, printed the, the word America. He instead uh, uh, put these um, cannibals, no, like in, in, in this fire uh, uh, with the uh, parts of human beings being like something horrible. But uh, it was something that, uh, as you said, uh, afterwards was represented by other cartographers. Uh, and uh, well, it, it was, um, I think, one of the first representations of uh, cannibals in a map with this uh, graphic um, in, well, um, sign or whatever, but image. But um, as well in this map, he put something about the Esmeraldas in, in the Caribbean and mm -hmm. near the uh, Colombia, in, in near the island Margarita, no? Mm -hmm. So, and he says that these uh, are, uh, sorry, my, my uh, audifonos, uh, that the, they are vassallos of the King of Spain and mm -hmm. that uh, actually they are like uh, these, uh, he used this, um, his word, uh, which word is, is like uh, like someone very vile that they, mm -hmm. but they, they deserve themselves to the king of, of Spain and that they are very rich in, in margaritas, which which Sebastián de Covarrubia says was the word they used for the Esmeraldas. Well, mm -hmm. that was one thing. And another, Super interesting. Question, another question was about, um, um, uh, it's very interesting about you, that you have been focusing on Puerto in, sorry on uh, uh, República Dominicana and on Santo Domingo and uh, La Española because I have been like uh, well working a bit on uh, this um uh, uh, well this expedition of um, of uh, Cromwell to the mm -hmm. The, the El Plan Antillano de Cromwell uh -huh, uh -huh. and um, the 17th they, century. They are trying to make the the, the same thing that Drake uh, did in 1584 mm -hmm. or 88, 86, mm -hmm. I don't remember. And uh, they are trying, sorry, to um, to, to 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 take a Santo Domingo to mm -hmm. stop the. Um, to, 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 well, to take the, the island and then to take Santo Domingo afterwards to mm -hmm. take La Española and then mm -hmm. to go to Cartagena and to make mm -hmm. a kind of blocking for Spain. Yeah. Um, to do something like a strategical invasion of Spain after having yeah. like uh, blocked the Caribbean. No? And mm -hmm. all these, because actually in this epoch, they, the English uh, following Hackley, they say uh, the Caribbean is the apple of the eye of the mm -hmm. of Spain, no? so well he he fails uh, um, the, the play yeah. the this um plan fails because they can't take santo domingo and it seems that it was because well there were many factors but one of the main factors was apparently according to the chronicles because they um they were put on shore very far away from the river um uh, uh, Sosama, the river. The Osama River. They were they con they were confused, and and they were like desembarcados uh, in mm -hmm. uh, much more to the west. So mm -hmm. they were uh, even when they were a very big number, they failed, and all this expedition failed because of that. And then I was thinking that perhaps there was there were many maps of even of the of the Flemish, the British, Spain, uh, well. 
uh, French, because mm -hmm. I, I'm not so sure as you, I think you said, that uh, the Spanish maps were like open to anyone, to everyone. They, they were secret maps, no? But mm -hmm. uh, they, they, the Flemish had made many uh, maps of the Caribbean and the, and the British some, um, but they didn't have a, a large scale map with detail. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. do you know if there are any you know, map for the sixteen, sorry, the yes, the sixteen forties, for instance, um, because it was then uh, when they were landing in, uh, in 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 the river. No, they were treating, trying to, uh, to 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 make this same uh, movement of like, like okay. and they would, of of course, like. Uh, uh, using maps, the maps that were uh, available for England in in, in the in, by the that uh, epoch. Sorry, it was a big. <laughs> no, it's super <laughs> interesting. No, thank Sorry. you so much for your question, Lourdes. Uh, for both of your questions, super interesting. Just to cover uh, my bases here, super interesting what you're saying about the Sebastian Munster. I do, I do consider his his work in my book, but for. Time for time constraints. I, I wasn't able to present uh, his work, uh, but yeah, it's um, he uh, the map you're referring to was from the mid 16th century, and by this time, it's important to remember that the uh, the carnival laws were were in place, right? Like during Charles the uh, First or Charles the Fifth. Carlo Magno, but Carlo I of Spain, or, or Carlo V, um, uh, the, the carnival laws uh, were those laws by which um, con uh, co colonization, uh, conquest was and, and subjugation of the indigenous populations was precisely justified and encouraged if they uh, could just if they could uh, prove that the indigenous were or they could label the indigenous populations as cannibals. So if there's any settlers, and it's interesting because um, when the, even the Germans, when the Germans established the, the German colony in Venezuela, uh, we're talking about 1528 through uh, 1554, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by the end, in Venezuela, uh, they were very, um, very aware of this law and, and, uh, and the, the, the labeling of indigenous populations as cannibals. That's, that's something that comes from the very early on chronicles of, of the Caribbean. But usually the Tainos, uh, after discovering other territories, the Tainos, the indigenous populations from the Caribbean were mainly represented as, as good, humble people, uh, the Tainos yeah. uh, against Mm -hmm. the Aruacos, the Caribes, no? mm -hmm. and then los Incas, and then all the indigenous uh, nations, groups, communities from, the, from South America were depicted in uh, contraposition to the Tainos as cannibales. So that, I think that's uh, right, like the, 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 why then from the uh, populations that inhabit and then as you mentioned in the in this uh, in this way, Brazil, uh, then it will be. It, it makes sense that it will include. He would include can, is less cannibales or cannibalist places in uh, in the part of in that part of South America or in South America in general as a cannibal place because it was much more difficult to settle and conquest. It was a different no than the than the islands in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's super interesting. Like I would, I would love to, to. Co I would really like very much to collaborate with you uh, in this okay. project and future uh, projects in the near future. Um, mm -hmm. Related to uh, Cromwell, it's super interesting that I, I the Cromwell design and how they incorporate 16th century uh, Elisa Elisa. Um, Elizabethan or let's see Queen Elizabeth ideas like because after Queen, Queen Elizabeth in, in 1595 when she sends Francis Drake to the Caribbean one last time and he dies actually he mm -hmm. doesn't make it back home uh, he's uh, she is uh, she's giving instructions to him to actually create that sort of blockage 
in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Like to take Hispaniola and Cuba or any any of those, like either Hispaniola or Cuba, to to create like a like a military base, no, and in, mm -hmm. and be able to intercept all the eh, galeones, no, el situado mexicano, and all of that. And that mm -hmm. that's part of the the per expedition's purpose. Uh, something that will be retrieved by Cromwell, right? Mm -hmm. But something that will be forgotten for a couple of decades during uh, James the First or Jacobo Primero's uh, Queen Elizabeth's successor. So it's very interesting to see how Cromwell retrieves mm -hmm. part of Queen Elizabeth's projects that mm -hmm. were in the making twenty years before or thirty. Mm -hmm. um, what happened in that trip or that voyage, voyage in 1595, they know the, the route already. Like you're talking about how the parallelism about uh, Drake and all these plants and, and then this other uh, expedition that you narrated in detail. So it happened the same thing. Like it, it, there's no, the, there were maps. I, I don't mean that there were, that, Spanish maps were public. They were actually concealed, as you say. You're totally right about that. But there was there were circulating uh, cosmographic in information in England, like, and that's something that Richard Hawkins uh, talks about. Um, mm -hmm. Like there was there were spies, you know. They, they were mm -hmm. the, the yeah. English were pretty informed about. Mm -hmm. So they, so when Drake went in the in that last voyage. They, they were on the same water, the same ocean, were five years before to that. They won, you know, they, they pillaged those places. And Drake, according to um, uh, Maynard, uh, that's, that's the, uh, I forgot his first name right now. Uh, Maynard, M-A-Y. Uh, and ARD yeah. uh, Thomas Maynard if I'm not mistaken is the one who writes about that trip uh, and he, even nice. Drake at, even he says at some point that Drake's he's older of course he's 10 years older and he says oh my god I can't even recognize these places anymore and I knew them as I knew like the palm of my hand mm -hmm. these indies they have changed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is he referring to? We don't know specifically, but he says that he cannot uh, identify the coast anymore as he could, as he could do before to that. So we're seeing that, yeah, there were maps. They even he has the experience and still he made mistakes all over the place. Mm. Sí, sí. Mm, Pero súper interesante, podemos seguir mm -hmm. colaborando. Sí, claro que sí, gracias. Y así, a los mapas en los 1640s, como usted preguntaba, en los 1640s, yes, all these maps were circulating, Mercator's maps, mm -hmm. and yeah. like all of them. Sure, yeah, and they were translated, oh, well, actually the chronicle to many. Yes, yeah. yes. Anyway, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can keep sharing information about this by, by email. And, okay, yeah. thank you. Bye. Thank you, Lourdes. Gracias. Adiós. So I have uh, one more question. I was wondering about the timing of the depopulation of the Caribbean islands and the rise of piracy. Was would, Did they happen more or less simultaneously, or was there a, a, a gap between them? Or how, how what was the timing like? So uh, there are different theories about it, right? The, there, there have been some... D different approaches to uh, explain the depopulation and piracy. If piracy came first, or the depopulation came first, right? So we have a little bit of both, I want to say. Yeah. Like, uh, we sh uh, certainly, uh, the, the, the insular Caribbean, right? And with that, I'm, I'm referring to the principal islands in Alonso de Santa Cruz's words. Uh, Cuba, Jamaica, eh, eh, Santo Domingo, República Dominicana, and Haiti, eh, that were the, the most populated ones. Because if we talk about the other Antilles, the little ones, they were like, they were barely inhabit, eh, inhabited right. at some point by Spaniards, of course, because the information yeah. that we have, it's mainly uh, uh, counting the Spaniards' vecinos. 
and some of the indigenous populations, but we're not certain, unfortunately, we don't have that detailed information. So the population of the Caribbean started as early as in the 1520s um, because everybody wanted, because nobody, the settlers, they once Hernan Cortes took against the governor's orders and the king's orders and took a fleet and went from Cuba and reached Yucatan. And uh, come on, lo and behold, five years later, and he's the viceroy of the new, of new Spain. Everybody wanted to try their luck. Mm. It's like, it's like, uh, like uh, it's something with the entradas as they were calling, like these expeditions. So every Spanish settled, they had to settle first in the Caribbean islands. Those were specifically in Hispaniola was the main center for that. And then from Hispaniola, they will transfer to Cuba. And then from Cuba, they will transfer, transfer to the rest of the, the continent and to keep exploring uh, through these entradas or discoveries that were funded, privately funded, um, it was like it was a private investment in that sense mm -hmm. and and they didn't want to yeah they didn't it's like uh it's it's like today's economy of uh new generations that they say i'll just have to make a video to go viral and then i'm gonna be a millionaire i don't have to go to college i don't have to go to i don't have to get a job i can just go viral so that was the mentality about going to the americas it was mm -hmm. i'm gonna make it just as hernan cortez and then you put into the mix the hermanos pizarro in the case of the incan empire like everybody so so yeah the caribbean was depopulated because of that uh first because of those um uh, that desire and interest of becoming like the the next new mm -hmm. millionaire, and um, uh, so they went off. They went, and uh, if they would settle in the islands, then they would have to establish an encomienda, have some indigenous uh, uh, individuals to work at the encomienda or the or you know in agriculture. They will have to work in agriculture because there were not enough mines in the Caribbean in comparison to the continental territories to become a millionaire in, in, in one hour or five years. So mm -hmm. the investment and the labor that required to become a wealthy person in the island was very uh, limited in comparison to those who try, try their luck in the uh, in the in the continent in continental America, however, so that on one side, so yeah, it was depopulating, depopulating, and when you have the population, then you have more invasion and establishment of Sp uh, non-Spanish or non -I non mm. uh, uh, Iberian uh, Peninsular uh, settlers in the Caribbean or interlopers because they're not the Spanish crown, they, they don't have the means or even the interest to actually police the zone. They try. They try to establish an Armada de Barlovento, an Armada de Sotavento by the end of the 16th century. And then they retreat that project in the 17th century, but it didn't work and it was too expensive. So they tried to protect it, but it was too little too late. So yeah, it was... But another thing that is inter interesting and it's another phenomenon, it's the, the depopulation of regions in the islands. Like for instance, like we have a case in Puerto Rico where today we have a town in the Western part that is called San Germán. And in the past, San Germán was a municipality on the coast and now it's not on the coast anymore. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. had to move cities or depopulate spaces within the island. And that's what happened to Hispaniola. That's precisely why we have Haiti and the Dominican Republic. That's why we have a fragmented island with two different crowns, the Spanish crown and the French crown. Spain could not gain control of the Western part of Hispaniola. So they just said they're too much, 
demasiado contraband, too much contraband, too much attacks. It's too expensive to counter attack. So let's just move the towns to the east and leave that to them. So we do see the population of the Caribbean, uh, of spaces in those islands in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. even maintaining Spanish jurisdiction in the same island, like the like the case of Hispaniola. And then mm -hmm. they finally, in, in the 17th, in the 18th, in the, by the end of the 17th century, the 1680s, they said, yeah, France, you can take it. Like it's, it's they all speak French, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, uh, well, it's more complicated, of course, but. Sure. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, someone's arriving late, it looks like, but uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Ethan? Is he? Hello, Ethan? I, I would hate to... Uh, Say goodbye as soon as he arrives. But Ethan, if you are, do you have a question or thought or remark? I'm not sure. Well, I, I think we should probably uh, let Mariana have a little bit of a rest after uh, that uh, wonderful effort and, and accomplishment of her talk. So thank you very much again, Mariana, thank for you. sharing your work with us. Uh, it's easy to find her book online. And I would recommend both her book and uh, her recent article that I mentioned. And again, we will continue this series of talks. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much, Chet. And thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Geopam, for the collective, for having me and allowing me to present.